Gurami is an international educator, advisor, board member, and author. She's also very humble, so she's cringing as I read this. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the Berkeley Haas School of Business, and her latest book is Super Flexibility for Knowledge Enterprises, which focuses on practical approaches for strategizing, organizing, and leading knowledge enterprises. And you'll hear a little bit about some of the work that she's done in this area um, over the course of her session today. Um, she's also um, the faculty director of several programs at Berkeley and has been the faculty director for several custom programs for companies such as Adobe, Statoil, and Visa across a range of different industries. Um, she also serves as a member of the board of directors of multiple public technology companies. And I must say, I've been to several meetings where I've been asked, do you happen to know Professor Barami? And I say, yes. And all of a sudden, it's just eyes light up. Uh, she's a rock star. So, um, most importantly, I, I guess, not most importantly, but importantly, she's the faculty director of our Leading Change Readiness and Agility program, uh, which is a three-week program that we do in partnership with Berkeley Haas. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Professor Barami to develop that program, and so I know that you're in uh, for a treat. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Homer Barami. too much. You're now <laughs> embarrassing me. It's a real <laughs> pleasure and an honor to be here with you uh, today. So many accomplished executives in the room and you lead the learning and development initiatives and other functions in your leading edge companies. As uh, Stephen mentioned, I wear three different hats. I am an educator first and foremost. I've been at Berkeley since the late 1980s. Um, I am an um, advisor and a board member. At the end of the day, you mentioned ROI. Um, it really wakes you up when you advise companies and they have to put it into practice and you have fiduciary responsibilities. So that really informs your judgment. And I'm also a researcher uh, because at the end of the day, as Stephen mentioned, the world is changing in a big way and we need to be on the front line of seeing what are the new trends, new thinking, new ideas that are emerging. So I try to bring all three hats into the equation and today I'm going to share with you a little bit of some of the key learnings that I've had about leading in a VUCA world and being change ready. And as Stephen mentioned, this is part of our program with Exec Online, uh, which is about change readiness and agility. Um, take a look at this uh, image. You know, I moved to the United States from the UK back in the 1980s. And at the time I moved, I just finished my PhD. I had looked at really major industrial age organizations like Shell, BP, Cadbury Schweppes, many of the names that you might be familiar with, but they were the backbone of our industrial age thinking. I came to Silicon Valley as a young postdoc at Stanford Business School, and it was r like arriving on a different planet. Um, I thought to myself, I've spent five years doing a PhD, researching 21 multinational companies, and I don't know how to apply any of it to what I'm seeing over here. So that was the beginning of my fascination with change readiness agility, flexibility, which has been the core of my work during the last three decades. And if you look at these two images, this is the world we've lived with. Um, the skyscraper is a visual image to signify that for the past 100 plus years. This is the backbone of our industrial age thinking. What you see on the right with the raft is the VUCA world that we're living in today. And the challenge we have is that many of the recipes, tools, practices, techniques that worked in a world of relative stability and predictability do not quite work in a VUCA world. We have to reinvent the way we think about these things. At the same time, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we're not talking about a wholesale blood transfusion here, we're talking about 
sort of really taking elements of our industrial age leadership models, organizational practices that worked and really evolve them, adapt them, iterate them for the new VUCA world. Now, this presents us with a challenge. Um, if I put on my research hat, I really have to think about three different dimensions of this change. At an individual level, as a leader, what are the skill sets, the tool sets, the competencies I need to succeed as a team, and ultimately as an organization. How do I structure myself? How do I design my processes? How do I leverage technology? How do I incorporate acquisitions and so on? So today we're really going to focus more on just giving you a glimpse of the individual and the team component. And as I talk to leaders in different industries and we work with them, as Stephen mentioned, in many of our immersive programs, uh, these are some of the challenges that they talk about. You know, we have to reinvent our business models, introduce new products, integrate acquisitions, simplify our processes, automate many of our processes to make ourselves scalable. And we have to do all of this stuff with limited resources. So change readiness is just some theoretical <laughs> thing that we talk about. This is the reality that I hear on the ground. And so given that perspective, this presents major frontline challenges for our leaders today. Let's see if you relate to them. Overload, juggling many different priorities and stakeholders. How many of you in this room relate to this? I just want a show of hands just to see you know, how real are these for you. Number two, aggressive deadlines. Everybody wants it now. You know, in the past, I had time to plan, to think, to organize, to get my act together, and now I've just got to do it on the fly. Raise your hands, please. I just like to kind of get a show of hands and see. And then the third one, and this was partly the motivation for putting together our change readiness course with Exec Online and many of the immersive custom programs we do for companies. Thinking like a passenger, not a driver. What does that mean? If I'm being bombarded every day with different needs, stakeholders, priorities, emails, I've got no time to think because everybody wants it now. I'm just always in a reactive mode. I can barely keep up with the challenges. So the real purpose behind my work is to turn you as enterprise leaders into drivers with a concrete playbook that enables you to be proactive and take charge. And it was fascinating looking at Stephen's numbers of how many of that critical middle um, feel they can't translate strategies into actions. They feel they cannot take the initiative to make change happen. So this is the reality that we see on the ground, is everybody's just sort of dealing with the challenge of today and hoping for the best for tomorrow. So this just gives you a little bit of context um, for what I do and why this whole issue of how you lead in a VUCA world has become important. And I kind of like this visual because I think we are today at this sort of chasm. A lot of our theories, tools, techniques, practices were really developed for industrial age thinking. And now we find ourselves in the new digital VUCA world, which is characterized by lots of change, uncertainty. So how do we bridge this gap? And what do we do about it? And this is really the focal point of my research and my interest in this work. So when we look at companies that are trying to reinvent themselves, we find that they face at least three sets of challenges at the individual leader level. Number one, comfort zone. We are creatures of habit. We 
repeat. Think about how you drive a car. Think about how you brush your teeth. We rely on our instincts in order to deal with everyday situations. So that's one barrier. How do I put myself outside of my comfort zone and start thinking differently about these new challenges? And certainly as an educator, this is my primary role, to put my executives, my students outside of their comfort zone so that they can think differently about the challenges. Number two, legacy and history. This worked for me in the past. It's continuing to work for me in the future. But as we know, what got me here is not necessarily going to get me there. And then number three, over-reliance, especially what I see in many large enterprises on big bank approaches. Big bank is useful. You're changing your strategy. You acquire a company because you need the technology and the product. But big bank has its limitations in a VUCA world. So those are three sets of challenges that we see. Now, I think in this session, I don't want just to hear my own voice. I want to hear from you. And we have a little discussion question for you. As you think about your own challenges and experiences in your own organizations, and you think about leaders you have worked with closely, impactful leaders you worked with, what do you think made them impactful? What was it about their personal qualities or the way that they approached the problem? which made them effective in what they did. So I'd like us to take five minutes and huddle with a colleague next to you, reflect on this question, and then we'd like to come around and hear from you and see what you think about this issue. And then I'm going to uh, share with you some of the lessons I've learned about the profiles and the skills and the competencies that are effective in a VUCA world. Let's take five minutes, brainstorm, and then we'll have mics, and we look forward to a quick debrief. One, one, key, one key competency, one or two leaders. Yeah, with a colleague next to you.
Okay. We'll start in one minute. One minute, please. Ready for a debrief? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you mind debriefing? I'll start with you. Sure. On the mics. Yeah. Sure. We'll start over there Absolutely. with a group up there. I'll be ready wherever you want me to go. That first row, okay. they're going to kick us off. Okay. We're going to start a quick debrief. Sorry to interrupt. Hopefully this conversation will continue during the break. But we're going to start with a few debriefs just so that we can hear each other. and. Our group over here is kindly going to kick us off, so perhaps you can tell us what you discussed. So we tried to identify some of the qualities we thought that these leaders who effectively drive change would have. And a couple things that we identified were they uh, clarify the why, so why you need to do that and what's in it for me, transparency, authenticity, and uh, they make you feel like you're in the know. You always feel like you're in on what's happening. And um, they have a way to kind of show the positive of, of this change. And <laughs> there were a few others we're forgetting. I think that's a great start. Thank you very much for kicking us off. Who's going to be next? Let's hear from three or four more. Yes, please. We have one back. Thank you. Yeah, they also are good at uh, relationships with their people and they're able to pull things out from their people and are open versus having already some prescribed opinion. They're open to whatever comes out of that conversation. And that openness is really key. We call it, are you a sponge or are you porcelain? Yeah. You know, and I hopefully that's a metaphor that will stick in the back of your mind. <laughs> And I'm sure whenever you interact with your leaders, you know whether they're open or not. So I think that's a, that's a great point. Let's hear some more, perhaps this side of the room. Any takers here? Anybody would like to share with us, please? Um, we talked about the fact that our uh, senior leaders are very humble and they really want to know what the people in that middle management level are doing and making more efforts to communicate directly to them mm -hmm. um, through lots of uh, ways. But we were talking about the skip, skip level meetings and things of that nature. So really getting yeah. to, to hear it from them versus the people that you know, report directly to them. You, you, you raise a very important point because we find one of the real enablers in a VUCA world is the ability to get firsthand, unfiltered information. Because if information is filtered through multiple channels, multiple levels, multiple functions, it gets distorted. And it may not resemble um, you know, the eventual, <laughs> the real information that you wanted to, to convey. So I think that is an important quality. If we can move to that side of the room, please. Any, any volunteers on this side, please? Uh, I think what I've noticed in uh, one of the person which we became a leader in just front of me, and uh, I would say most of the people they're afraid in doing KT sessions and not sharing their knowledge with other people. Yeah. Uh, the person which I'm talking about, he, he was very, very positive that till the time you're not sharing your knowledge with your colleagues and people who, mm -hmm. are, who are reporting to you, you cannot go to the next level because you are not giving your work to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you are becoming stagnant in yourself. So you have to, for, to be to a next level, you should definitely share as much knowledge to people who are working with you and jump on to the next level and become a leader. 
This is one of my favorite areas. I'm a huge believer in leader as teacher. And one of the key elements of an effective teacher is you're there to share your wisdom and your knowledge. So if as a leader you're willing to put on your teaching hat as well, that is something that really enables you to do what you're saying, which is share what you know and cascade it to a much broader community. Thank you for that. Please. Hi. We talked about some of these things, but one of the other things that I've seen of a leader is to bring people along with you. So when mm -hmm. you're trying to implement change, try and bring the team, bring together maybe a committee um, to help implement that change and have them be part of it. So have them come up with ideas on how to effectively to how to how effectively implement that change so they feel part of it, that it's not happening to them. Mm -hmm. but. Well, actually, you remind me, and I wrote a case study about this um, not long ago, about a biotech company that was going through a very, very difficult time. And the CEO decided that their whole culture and the way they did things had to be reinvented. But instead of getting together with his senior leadership team and developing the culture themselves, they said, we are looking for volunteers from rank and file who form a sort of a culture task force and you are going to drive this initiative. By the way, this company, not only did this, this small group of frontliners that volunteered, not only uh, developed some of the cultural tenets and then tested them out with the leaders, but this company bounced back so dramatically, uh, they were just sold a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, for eight and a half billion dollars. So, uh, you know, sometimes some of these, when you bring people along and when they're committed and they feel they're with you and they're not just um, you know, there to do a specific job, it makes a huge emotional difference to the population. One last one, any final takers from any part of the room? Anybody would like to? Adrian, please. Yeah, I think uh, one of the common traits we saw was a compelling ability to share a vision of what was intended, whether it was over three years or five years. And by setting that down cleanly and crisply, it really galvanized employees to understand at least the context. And uh, that was a big differentiator. And that is a perfect segue into some of my lessons learned. I have worked with, studied, advised, interacted with a whole range of leaders across a whole portfolio of different industries and sizes and environments. And, you know, I have clustered and summarized those into these five core attributes, which I call the adaptive DNA profile. And this is about individuals' instinctive approach to driving change. This is not a personality test. This is not, you know, really looking at you as a whole. This is just looking at your capacity and instinctive approach to driving change. So what does it mean? So we have five different dimensions of adaptive DNA. Robustness, and Adrian, you mentioned a very important word, which is vision. Let's start with robustness. You saw the image of a crocodile in the previous slide. What does a crocodile do? What do you associate with a crocodile? They eat, you. they eat you. They are a predator. They have a clear intention. They have a clear vision. Right? They have a clear vision for success. And when you look at visionary entrepreneurs who've unleashed the digital transformation we're going through, this is their dominant DNA, robustness. Give you an example, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, started the company 20 years ago, and he called it Netflix, because he imagined that one day you'll be able to watch the movies through the internet. But what do you think Netflix did for the first few years to get going? Sent you DVDs via mail. This is an example of a vision, anticipate. 
You might have read in the news recently that Elon Musk said within the next decade, we're going to be ready to go to space. And I don't know if it's the moon or Mars or <laughs> some other planets, but that is an example of a vision. You really look at the long term. You think like an intentional driver that has a destination in mind. You're not just getting in your car and saying, I'm going to drive. I don't know where to, but hope for the best. The second DNA. So the, the robust DNA is about being a visionary. These are people who understand what future success looks like. These are people who have a clear intention. These are people who are persistent, follow up, and follow through. Resilient DNA. Remember the starfish. What is a resilient DNA, do you think? It's about the capacity to bounce back. One of the things that we know about the VUCA world is you won't succeed in everything. Failure or setbacks, as we like to call them in Silicon Valley, are part of the process. So the point is not whether you fall down. The point is how you get up. And what do we associate with resilient DNA? Realistic optimism, because if you become so pessimistic, what do you think happens to your ability to recover? You lose hope. Future focus, you don't dwell on the past, you don't dwell on who's to blame. And thirdly, what I like to call lots of baby steps. Lots of quick wins that give you confidence and give you the ability to take on the more challenging assignments. Let's go to the third one, hedging DNA. These are people who look around corners. These are people who anticipate plan A, plan B, plan C. What's my backup plan if plan A comes about? You find a lot of these leaders in, as I mentioned, biotech industry because there are many, many, many risks that they have to take. Number four, the agile DNA. A lot of people talk about agility. What does it take to be agile? Well, our research shows that these leaders are minimalist in their approach. If a one-line email is good enough and I can send it now, it's better than waiting for 24 hours to send one paragraph. If I have a problem that I have to deal with, I confront it now instead of hoping it goes away. So thinking minimalist enables you to be agile. What are the minimum must-haves, not the maximum nice-to-haves? And secondly, they're very, very good at spring cleaning. If you add two other projects to my plate, what do I take off? or what I put on the back burner. And last, by no means least, the versatile DNA. Remember the image of the chameleon. What does that mean? That is very much about many of, your, many of the themes you talked about. My ability to relate to people, my ability to engage them, to give them a sense of purpose, to teach them, to be authentic, to share information. So these are the five core, and I've gone through them very quickly in our course. Of course, we provide a lot more detail. Uh, but these are five kind of conceptual constructs that I hope give you a framework for thinking about many of these things. And then we've developed a very simple survey tool that uh, participants take so that they can understand their own adaptive DNA. Because we all have one or two dominants. And for example, this slide shows you one individual from our program. And you see the yellow line shows this individual's domin dominant DNA, which is hedging, very good at planning, but very little on robust DNA. So hopefully, this helps them become self-aware and in the process figure out how to complement themselves with their team and others around them that have other capabilities. 
Uh, this is another example. This one is a different one, very strong versatile DNA, chameleon, ability to interact with many different constituencies, but scores pretty low on the hedging DNA. Again, there's no good or bad. We're all different. The key point here is to know what you are. And that enables you to say, okay, I need to be more thoughtful here, and I need to surround myself with people who you know, have the capabilities that I don't. Um, so that is, a, that is a quick whirlwind tour <laughs> of the five components of adaptive DNA. I'm going to pause here before we move on and see if you have any reflections, questions, before we move on to the team component. Anything? And of course, during the break, please don't hesitate. Come up if you have any specific questions related to your situations. OK, so to sum up on the individual DNA, uh, this enables you to basically shift gears as an individual. When do I need to put on my hedging hat? Perhaps when I'm doing my budgeting or planning a significant project. When do I put on my um, versatile hat? my chameleon hat, perhaps when I'm interacting with very different stakeholders? When do I put on my cheetah hat, my agile hat? When I've got to deal with you know, my email communication to critical stakeholders, when I have to deal with conflict situation, and I want to move quickly and resolve them. So moving on, I mentioned to you that this is not just about individuals. It's also about teams and organizations. And more recently, my focus has been on this middle area, which is how do teams drive change? Because as you said, at the end of the day, we're not individual islands. We work with other people. And so that has been the focal point of my work. And the reason for that is really simple. If you look at these two images, you see that our organizational structures are also evolving. We have lived in the industrial age with the mechanistic model of organization. We all know it really well. <laughs> I don't need to explain it. Top-down hierarchy, stable, predictable situation. We have lots of silos. Single brain focuses on your authority. And from a change readiness point of view, change happens once in a while. Uh, we are also moving today to what we call more dynamic models. I call this the blueberry pancake, which is you know, an opportunity to be more fluid. If you look at a company like Amazon, for example, if you look at a company like Google, a lot of their organizational structure is built and centered around teams. They still have a hierarchy, but I would say that they are moving to what I call the pirapan, which is a combination of the pyramid <laughs> and the pancake. So this is, uh, this is my feeble effort at uh, trying to portray this two-dimensional. Because a lot of people say, well, the hierarchy is going away. No, the hierarchy is still there because you still need control. You still need accountability. You still need discipline. That hierarchy, as you said earlier, has to be much more open, much more accessible, listen to the front line, bring people along, many of the themes that you reflected in your debrief. But what do you think the pancake is there for? Is there to innovate and to execute? Because if I want to execute, if I've got to move everything up the chain of command every time, what happens? I slow down, and nothing happens. And then six months later, I say, we kicked this off six months ago. Where is it? Well, indecision gets in. So this is where I see the sort of at least the more immediate future of organization. How do we get the best of both worlds? And this is, of course, where the teams come in, because the teams, whether you're cross-functional teams, your global teams, your intact teams are becoming the core foundation of that pyramid. And so we need to think about how do we make our teams work effectively in a fluid world. And this is, as I said, something I'm spending my time really looking at very actively 
these days. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a quick summary of what we have learned to date about what we call super flexible teams that can operate in a VUCA world. So this is, for example, an example from Spotify. And Spotify, this is how they portray their organizational structure. They have these three names of squads, chapters, and guilds. What is a squad? A squad is an intact team, a project team. What is a tribe? A tribe is a cross-functional team. And what is a guild? A guild is a community of multiple teams that have common interests. Now, I'm not going to pretend we worked all this out, but I just want to share with you what we can expect to see much more of. We just have to shift our thinking, and instead of just thinking about individuals, we have to start thinking about how do we orchestrate, drive, engage teams so they can innovate, they can execute, and ultimately take the organization to the next level. So very quickly, my um, going back to our adaptive DNA, these are some of the initial findings of our research on super flexible teams. How are they robust? Well, we talked about visionaries. Robust teams have a clear purpose and guiding principles. A team leader at Google told me that she has three guiding principles that she developed for her team of 120 software developers scattered around the world. And they are no divas, no cowboys, no surprises. If you have a problem, bring it early so we can solve it. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't wait till it's too late. No divas, because it's not just about you and your ideas. So that is an example of what we mean about the robust DNA in a team. Let's look at the resilient DNA. How do teams bounce back? And we see a lot of teams that go through many crisis situations. You know, right now, a very sort of common uh, theme is a lot of people are looking at Uber, for example, having the setbacks that they have experienced. And what we find with teams that can bounce back the key driver is trust and psychological safety. And you've heard a lot about psychological safety as a very important ingredient in teams. And as a leader, how do you create that? You create that by giving people voice. You create that, your point about being open, being sponge-like, listening to different points of view, even when you don't agree with them so that people feel my voice is heard, and you acknowledge it. Very important for resilient teams. Hedging, what does it take for teams to anticipate and th think 360? This is about a 360 perspective. How can I put myself in the shoes of the customer and look at life through their lens? How can I put myself in the shoes of a competitor how can I look at life through the shoes of a frontliner? How do I look at this problem through the lens of multiple stakeholders? And we see a lot of effective teams that do this well, you know, assign somebody on their team to be a devil's advocate. So their role is to challenge the group's assumptions and not to let them go down the groupthink path for example, as a practical tool. Or they encourage pro-con debate. You know, let's argue for this, and now let's argue against this, so that we can really see things uh, in, a, in a broader perspective. 
agile teams we find and we find a lot of these in software development they're very good at conflict resolution they deal with conflict head on as opposed to let it go underground and eventually bubble up somewhere and versatile teams these are about looking at the adaptive DNA of individual team members and thinking about, do we have a complementary team? The other day I was talking to the CEO of a mid-sized company and he was telling me that you know, his team had taken the adaptive DNA test survey and he says, boy, I now realize why we have such difficulty reaching decisions. We have too many crocodiles. <laughs> on the team. I was talking to another team that has difficulty making decisions for a different reason. They've got too many camels on their team. Too many people who are always planning and thinking about plan A and plan B, but at some point you've got to commit. So this is just some kind of initial findings that we're doing. We're going to dig much deeper. We want to develop a survey that helps you assess the DNA of your team and you know, how you basically move that uh, forward. But I just thought it might be interesting to give you some food for thought as we think about that. So um, wrapping up, why do we need to think about the adaptive DNA of individual leaders and teams? Because people, in order to synchronize, you need a common language common practices, common tools. One of the problems that we see in many companies is everybody's come from a different background and they have their favorite tool, their favorite framework, their favorite way of thinking about things, and sometimes they don't connect. So how do I create that common frame of reference so that we can all be alike? It's interesting, when I go inside some of the teams, Somebody says, oh, you're being too much of a camel now. Or, you know, you are just being a stubborn crocodile. <laughs> you know, this is time to give it up. So it's actually very interesting to see the simple language. And by the way, I deal with a lot of global teams. And one of the things about the animal metaphor is that everybody can relate to it. It's not culturally anchored in a particular culture. This is kind of a universal phenomenon. So bottom line, understanding your team's DNA helps you leverage uh, team members' strengths and create, hopefully, just like a sports team, a complementary team. Not everybody's on the defense and not everybody's on the offense. You know, you have a blend of the best of both. And the key takeaway for you is, you know, you might be, you know, Stephen mentioned ROI and impact. And these are four areas that we see the whole adaptive DNA conversation um, is being leveraged and is being used on a daily basis. Obviously, self-awareness, who am I? You know, it was interesting. I was my own first guinea pig, and yeah, I realized that I need to beef up my robust DNA. You know, this is something that I didn't do so well in. Uh, leaders development, many of you in learning and development function, how can you leverage this to help people boost uh, some of the DNAs that they don't necessarily have strength in? Um, and the other two have to do with the team. How do I compose a team that is complementary? And how do I put the right people in the right task? The other day, I was speaking to someone on a team and this individual scores really high on the hedging DNA, uh, the planning DNA. And they have put this individual in a role that is customer service, which requires you to have a very agile and versatile DNA. And this individual was very unhappy because felt, I'm a square peg in a round hole. So again, this is not a question of good or bad. It's a question of for what role, for what purpose. And these are the areas that we're seeing the sort of practical uses of the adaptive DNA. So let's wrap up and talk about future skill sets. I hope this gave you a little tiny taster 
of what we mean by adaptive DNA. And I like this quote, and it's from uh, leading HR executives from Visa, HPE, uh, Open Table, just published last month in Forbes. Historically, companies focus much more on hardcore technical skills necessary for specific jobs. Today, folks are looking at entrepreneurial tendencies and qualities such as resilience, improvisation, optimism, and interest in learning, especially learning from failure, which I thought was a very nice way of portraying the reality of the VUCA world we live in. And I'm just going to wrap up and leave you with my favorite uh, quote, which I'm sure you've heard of many, many times. It is not the strongest or the most intelligent that ultimately survive. It is the most adaptable. And I hope what this session did is give you some food for thought as you reflect on your own adaptive DNA and you think about the team and those individuals that you have to guide and help as they chart their way through the VUCA world. So thank you so very much for the opportunity to share some of this with you. I hope it was of interest. And of course, I will be available for any questions you have. I'm going to be here through uh, end of lunch tomorrow. So if you have any questions, any observations and comments, we'd be delighted to hear you. Thank you very much. And Homa, uh, we have time if you want to take a few questions now. Perfect. So let's see if you have. Uh, I love questions. I'm not. <laughs> so let's see. Any questions from anyone? Or comments or observations or things you want to know more of? Please. If I could just ask a question about your instrument. Is it validated and uh, reliable? Can you talk, well, talk a little we have, bit about that? Well, we developed that? this instrument. It's a, it's a great question. We constantly evolve this. But yes, we initially started with, our own, um, with my own students as guinea pigs. And I validated it across multiple different pilot group, groups. So, so far, we have used it with nearly 2,000 executives, and we're fine tuning it. And right now, where we're at is we're trying to use the in instrument to um, put together a team profile, because obviously, we have to do some iterations and view it through a different lens. So that's kind of current work in progress. But so far, yes. And you know, in terms of validation, I'm a believer that you've got to constantly improve. So as we get feedback um, from different people who take the instrument, we constantly tweaking it. Please. Oh. I just have to say, I'm a case study of one. I took your uh, a change agility online course, and the instrument was spot on for me. I need to develop my hedging adaptability. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I only have plan A. That's the best plan, and I, that's what I want to do. So are you putting that into practice? I'm just curious. To <laughs> But self-awareness is step number one, as you know. So thank you. <laughs> Please. Um, I just had a question. If you could share an example of an application activity that you may use with leaders when putting together the different types of change profiles. Yeah, I have a, you know, in my immersive programs, I basically, um, depending on where you score. So let's say you have a very low, I have a very simple template, and I use this along the five dimensions of DNA. So let's say you score very low on robustness. So the application exercise is, I'd like you to think about three non-negotiables that you are going to put together for your team. And the second part of it is, what does success look like for your team? And so that is like, for example, for robustness. Let's take versatility, chameleon. Let's say you score low on that. Um, I give you a set of tools that get you to think about three different stakeholders you deal with every day. And, and they, they have very different styles. So one person needs a lot of data, is, you know, is a perfectionist. The other individual says, give me the headline, and you know, I don't want to know all these details. And what is your approach for doing that? So as an educator, I believe my goal is to put people in their stretch zone. And these exercises kind of force people to think about their daily reality and how it links to adaptive DNA. 
In the ACRA course, um, what we do, as Stephen mentioned, we always have a change project that they are dealing with. So the, the application is, what do you need to do more of or less of as you drive this particular initiative? You're, you're asking a very good question. At the end of the day, it's one thing to understand this conceptually. It's very, very important to see how can you put it into practice and do that. So yeah, we, we do that. You know, on agility, for example, I say, you know, think about one conflict situation that you have on your plate but you haven't dealt with. What are three initial steps you're going to take in order to do this? And it's interesting, people come up with their own answers. My role is to be the midwife, <laughs> right? Is to help them give birth to their own babies because at the end of the day, they have to go and implement it, not me. Uh, and I'm there to be the catalyst, the helper, the sort of facilitator that moves it forward. So th that gives you a little glimpse of some of the application exercises. Please, please. Uh, let's have it. Let's have the microphone. So, other. important follow-up question. Um, these days, there's a huge debate between working on your weaknesses versus focusing on your strengths. When that question comes up, how do you handle that? Do you advise that they stick where they're strongest and really look for someone to supplement their weakness? or work on their weaknesses so they're much more well-rounded? So I'm a big believer in a balanced approach because I think if you only focus on your strengths and ignore your weaknesses, your weaknesses can come back to haunt you. I know they have come back to haunt me and many people I deal with. So I'm not a believer in a single magic formula and a silver bullet. I think it's really important to know what you're strong at and to make the most of it, absolutely. But I do think if you're not aware or you don't tune in to some of your weaknesses, um, you know, what are your stretch opportunities? And I, you know, I'm an educator. I like people to constantly stretch and to constantly learn. One of our mottos at Berkeley is students always. You're always a student, right? So you know, I, I have an a, a example of my, my son who just started, he graduated about 15 months ago and he started his first job and he just finished his first review. And it was interesting in this very detailed review that they gave, they talked about his major strengths, but where do you think his focus ended up being? On the one or two areas they identified and it's really amazing he's taken that to heart and it's given him a platform for saying I, I need to build on this I need to improve this so I just think we need to be balanced in that and we can't just be myopic and think about one so that's my personal philosophy uh, I have slightly long-winded question please so, um, <laughs> Um, as you were as you were talking about these different profiles, I could I couldn't help but relate it to social styles yeah. as 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 a parallel. It's a great point. And uh, uh, having administered social styles many times, I am aware that you know um, um, the social styles like, like let's say for example the crocodile is very similar to the uh, the tiger in social <laughs> styles. And uh, where you 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 where the social style says that you know it is uh, specific to the role you are playing. And what I mean is, uh, let's say, for example, I can be uh, a tiger with my brother, as, <laughs> but I, I can be uh, amiable with my father. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I adapt my style based yeah. on where I am. So any insights as to if these are adaptive as well? In yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's why I talk about shifting gears, because I think you ask a very good question. You mentioned your father versus your brother. And um, let me just get back to... Um, um, this one, I just think that you need to know when, this is part of your toolbox. So I think toolbox. And just like a builder is got a toolbox and you don't use a hammer every time and you don't use a saw every time and you don't use a screwdriver every time, you use different tools for different purposes. Um, I kind of think of this, um, sorry, I'm trying to go back to this one visual that I hope portrays that. Um, and I basically think you need to know when to put on what hat and when to use what tool. So this is the one, right? So for example, you're at the beginning of a project. At the beginning of a project, you're starting a new company. You've got a new team. You've got to put on your robust hat. 
right? Because you're cl clarifying what's our goal, what's our purpose, what are our guiding principles, what does success look like, what's my vision for success? But, you know, let's say you are dealing with a team member who um, is very angry, is very upset, right? You don't walk in there as a crocodile and say, shut up and, you know, <laughs> let me run the show. No, you go there and you pull, you listen. Uh, you are much more low key. You're there to support. You're not there to drive. So I, I do think we need to start thinking toolbox. I think whatever metaphor you like, you like shifting gears, like in your car, or you like to thinking about using a different tool for different purposes, that is the secret to success. And not just, okay, I have a robust DNA. In every situation, I'm going to be a visionary. You know, that, that's not going to help you in a VUCA world. So I think excellent question. And I love your brother versus father analogy because I think all of us can relate to that. Please. Hi. I'm so curious about the way you use this as a, a way to sort of capture what a team looks like. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of tools out there from the individual perspective. Yeah. So yeah. interesting on how you sort of challenge a cheetah to be a camel, things like that. But talk to me a little bit about, or talk to us a little bit about how you go about surveying an entire team and get that classification. And then how do you challenge a team? It's a great question. And as I said to you, this is my current work in progress. So I'm happy to tell you what we're doing now, but I don't want to present it as a fait accompli. Um, so what we're doing right now is we are developing an instrument where uh, you do two things. Number one, you um, look at the leader's um, profile. What is the approach of a leader? And the leader does a self version of this for himself or herself, and then the team members do that assessment for the leader, so like a 360. The second one we're doing, and we're just in the pilot phase of this, is let's say we're a team of five. Each one of us does our own self-survey. And then we have a, a blended version of the team profile. So we can see how many of us, you know, what were the key dominants for the five members. And this is where the CEO of this company has got nine team members, and you know, he found quite a lot with a robust DNA. And then we do a debrief. We talk about what does that mean? What are some of the stumbling blocks? What are some of the opportunities that they have to leverage their robust DNA? So these are the two kind of surveys we're piloting right now. And we just have to simplify it. Quite frankly, right now, it's a little bit too complex. And we, we are in the process of sort of testing it with different groups to see what works and what doesn't work. But in a nutshell, one is the leader, because the leader sets the tone, creates the climate, you know, provides opportunities for people either to share or not to share. His or her ability to deal with conflict is really important. And then we, we need to look at the profile of the team members so the team as a whole understands it. So that's what we're doing at this point in time. And we haven't quite figured out you know, how we're going to evolve it. We're in the bang, right now, bang in the middle of piloting it. A great question. And if you have any suggestions, please, very open to any, any possibilities or ideas that you may have. Please, please see me and share. I'd love to hear. Thank you, Professor Barami. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.